Allen live in one minute. Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at PGHCityPaper.com. All righty. Hello there and welcome. Uh, Chris Potter does not want to talk about Nora Ephron. What kind of a jerk are you? The worst kind. Oh, you don't like her <laughs> movies. You don't like her writing. I don't, I know. Don't I don't, like don't her, think you know I've, I've, I don't. It's not you that know. I don't want there you to be discussion Silk? of her. I just have nothing to say. You never saw Silkwood? No, that's the one where she worked in the nuclear power plant or whatever. Yeah, no. No, that's Meryl Streep in... Um, no, that was Silkwood. Yeah, that was. Was that a nuclear power plant? I guess it was. Yeah. I well, so. okay. So, no. <laughs> I didn't see You that. never saw When Harry Met Sally? You no, never no. saw the scene I'll have what she's having? Mm-hmm. You know, no, I know. I know what it is, though. Out, she you, fakes the uh, orgasm yes, in the restaurant. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. I've never seen the movie, though. All right. Sorry. I, it's not that I don't think she's worthy of discussion. It's that I don't have anything to say, but that's cool. Okay. Maybe you could do a thing and I could go get a cigarette or something. Ha, ha, ha. Forget it. All right. Never mind. Um, look, one of our listeners sent me some um, Chinese money. Oh, this is, yeah. Well, this is, we'll all be using this soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> look at this. And, and, and the design here is... A bunch of tiny children looking at a globe, probably trying to decide what part of America to buy up next. <laughs> That's yeah. really cute. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, it's a, a ren, uh, renimbi, or I can't, I can never remember exactly how the what they're. I don't know. Is. I don't know what Renimbi, they call it. renimbi, something like I that. I don't know. He lives in uh, Singapore, but he was mm. in uh, Hong Kong. I guess is where he sent this from. Their and country's I, money is generally better looking than ours. Don't you think? What? It could, I, I think other countries' money is always more interesting. I mean, I guess because we well, don't see it all the what, time. But, but like they have like they'll tend to have little scenes. We always have these dead white guys, and here they've got like a bunch of little children learning about the world. You know what? Though I, I was in Chico- you know Chicago this weekend, mm-hmm. and my cousin, I was at her apartment, and she had mounted on her wall in a very tasteful you know way. It had been. What do you call that when you have a border around a thing and then a frame? Mm-hmm. A mat. Mm-hmm. A mat. <laughs> and she had this series of mats, and and in the middle of each one was a, a p- piece of American uh, currency. Is currency reply? Does that apply to paper? Yeah, well, yeah. Very okay, much so. okay. I somehow thought you had to jingle. So. Um, and it turns out it was her dad's and that he had saved these bills from the time he was a kid. Wow. And some of these American bills were mind-blowing. How do you mean? They didn't look anything like they look now. The oldest one was 1880-something, 1880. Mm-hmm. Some of them had amazing pictures on them. A lot of them were, had the names of various banks. So mm. they were issued by mm-hmm. different banks, mm-hmm. I guess, before we set up before the, we the Federal, Federal Reserve. Reserve. Right. So, and they had lots of different dead white men on it. There was one, one amazing one with this huge buffalo and then Lewis's picture and Clark's picture mm. Mm. and all this stuff. I didn't see any, like, dancing children or anything like that. But, but they were... They were really interesting and different looking. Hmm. Yeah, wow. And they were all backed by the gold standard in those days. Back when yeah, currency yeah, counted yeah, for right. something. And like McKinley <laughs> was on one of the bills. Oh, there you go. That'd be, that was a collector's item about 
So, I mean, I, Three it's only... In his presidency. But the bills do keep changing. I mean, in your lifetime, they've changed quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the general content remains but the it, same. But some of the, the Yeah. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> so. Yeah. Pata. Cullen. Um... What do you think the big story is? I do want to talk to you. I, I failed to talk about it yesterday because I was waiting to talk uh, to you about it. Oh, good. Because yesterday my sister was on, and uh, she doesn't give a damn about what Mike Terzai said. But um, right. I, wanted, I wanted to... Boy, I bet he's in trouble. I mean, with his compatriots. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. He, he, he simply spoke... The, the truth, truth. Right, exactly. and there's nothing that gets a politician in more trouble right. than that right i mean you know the 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 post the remark of course for those who've been living under some sort of rock who aren't voting republican um is uh he was before gathering of the faithful and he said you know look at all the stuff we've delivered um We've delivered pro-life legislation for the first time in 22 years, which I think is an interesting remark. Well, that is, uh, he he said pro-life, because that's not how they sold that either. Right. They sold that. This is these these onerous rules that they've uh, promulgated that essentially will put out of business a number of uh, Planned Parenthood clinics. And they supposedly, when they were debating it on the It was all about the woman's safety. Oh, it was all about the health of women. Right. It really was about... Closing Advancing down a pro-life agenda. Right. So the, he put the lie to two. Right. So he says that. And then what was the other Stand one? Stand your ground. Stand your yeah. ground. Castle doctrine. Castle gun doctrine. rights. Yeah. And, an and by passing the voter ID, we've ensured, ensured a Mitt Romney, Romney victory, victory this November. Now, the spin on that from the Republicans oh, is... Oh, please. Well, you know, fraud happens. And what we were saying is now <laughs> the Democrats can't steal the election from us. So Okay, and then how do they respond to the fact that they cannot come up yeah. with what? One? Can they come up with one or maybe three instances of fraud in, uh, in a Pennsylvania election in, in the last 500 yeah. years or something? There is no fraud! Nobody ever saw it, see it, it doesn't happen. But that's just the thing, Lynn. It's so well designed, you don't see it. Oh, I know those Democrats are so nefarious. They're so brilliant. And you know, you know, in fact, Democrats are defrauding the polls because otherwise, how could Obama be ahead in those? And there's just another one out today that says he's up by six or seven points. Oh, no, that's impossible. So, so right, they're again, done it. I mean, I thought, that, I thought the most interesting thing about this whole fraud debate is you go back and you look at, you know, some of these remarks like Bob Gleason, who's the chair of the state Republican Party after the 2008 election. And I can't remember exactly what the margin was, but Obama beat McCain by something like 86 to 14 or 80. I mean, it was huge. It was. And Gleason said, "Uh, statistically, that's just not even possible. But if you actually go back and look, it was totally consistent with the polling that had been taken up to that point. So it's just this sort of thing of just like, we don't like the result. And it's hard to imagine how we could have gotten our butts kicked that badly. So clearly the other side cheated. That's right. I mean, either way, I think either way, it's suggestive of this sort of really paranoid mindset that just says, oh, you couldn't possibly have lost. Somebody we, we couldn't lose, and if they won, it's it, an illegit- it's an illegitimate victory. They said right. that about you know they say that every time right. a Democrat wins the White House, right? And uh, it should uh, Obama prevail uh, yet again? Believe me, it'll be said yeah, it'll go away. yet again, despite yeah. their all these these efforts, these incredible efforts, because <laughs> they've got voter ID now. In, I believe, the majority of states of this union, yeah. I think there's 30 states yeah. uh, that have it. Um, you know who this is going to disenfranchise the most? Old people. Old people, yep. And if you think about it, I think old people tend to be Republican voters, don't they? Mm. Why would they? I, I don't know that that's true. I'm thinking of the old people in nursing homes who don't have any... I, they vote. Who are easily swayed by TV ads. Well, yes. right, and they vote. Yeah. I, it's interesting, though. I mean, I, I don't... I'm trying to... It's certainly true that the average Republican voter is older and whiter than That's right. the average American. I don't know if that necessarily means... Well, that, if you look at polling and you look right, at how votes right, right, right. go, there, there are... Um, one of the stark... It, it's sort of like uh, the 60s revisitors. One of the stark dividing lines you right, see right. is age, um, generational, so that older people tend to 
vote Republican, and all of those young folks coming up, right? They're they're Democrats, right? And, and I mean, what we have seen well, on the one hand, there's been a lack of actual voter fraud, but we have already seen cases where these voter ID bills have disenfranchised people, Including and ironically, the some governor. of them tend to, some of them tend to be um, old. World War II veterans. That was one. There was one in okay. Ohio and in Florida as well. Did you hear in Florida how the governor himself? Yeah. Yes. Got yes. he he went to vote. This is not. This is like four years ago or something. And the Florida ID law got him because they said you can't vote. You're dead. <laughs> Our records say. Well, you're having dead. looked, I having seen the photos like, of the governor, he does look. He a does. Little he looks a little cadaverous. Yeah. yeah he does, I mean, he you does. know. So. So. Um, there will be uh, just an awful, and there, and also it has what an it has the effect, and this is another thing the Republicans love to do, of suppressing voter turnout, so that some people just throw up their hands and say, right, "I'm sure. not going to vote." Yeah, I mean, I think what I think what a lot of people don't think about um, is not just the effect on the person whose papers may not be in order, but on everybody standing in line behind that person. That's right. Um, because then you get delayed, and you know there's already concern from poll workers. Um, just even after you know we kind of had this dry run sort of yeah, the during primary. the spring primary, and and we're already hearing some some concerns from poll workers who were just like, this is this is this is a lot to ask, and I don't really want to be in a position of. Having to demand voter, you know, ID, extra ID from people who have been voting this place for 20 years. So do you mean, I mean, every time I voted, my voting place is, you know, very close to my house. I've walked out of my house. I've just gone down there. I voted. I have not carried a purse. I have not carried anything. So do you mean this time, if I were to do that, they would turn me away, even though they know damn well who I am? Yeah, you'd have to go back home and get here. It is insane. Huh? Well, just remember to bring your purse in. If you want, the, I'm sure the Democratic Party will be happy to drive you to the yeah. place with your purse. <laughs> but That's what we should be doing. That's what they should the be doing. The thing is, is those people at the, at my voting place, and I'm sure this is true of all, uh, they know everybody. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. I mean, they this, don't this is the kind of thing, they, it's the kind of government red tape that you ordinarily expect Republicans oh, to Oh, Republicans, oppose. government, in just mucking things up, right. mucking things up, making life harder. The Republicans are amazing. Jerks. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking forward to tomorrow's court ruling, aren't you? Uh, no, that's what I, I know. I, uh, no, <laughs> I am not. Before we get to tomorrow's, uh-huh. when we'll all be like bouncing off the walls sure. and stuff. Bear it. Anyway, <laughs> let's let's just back up and talk about oh, yeah. mm. what the court has done thus it hath wrought. far. Yeah, it's a mixed bag, yes. but I'd say uh, I actually found one of the rulings so outra- so dispiriting. Um, everybody's focused on the immigration one. I was mm. focused on the Montana case. Yes. Uh, that was the one I cared about. Now, when mm. they came down with Citizens United saying that, hey, corporations are people, and if they want to throw $700 billion into your congressional election and assure that their guy wins, that's Go perfectly okay. Right. Okay. Montana said, hey, wait a minute. And Montana, by the way, is a red state. Yes. Montana said, wait a minute. We have a law here. It's our state law. And it absolutely says, corporations, you stay out of our state politics. You are not going Mm -hmm. to be able to give money. Now, Mm -hmm. why does Montana have such a law? (laughs) Well, Montana has such a law because historically, which corporations would it be? Mining Mining companies? Mining interests. Mining interests. Okay. The big boys of the day. They simply bought the governorship. They bought the uh, the legislature. They bought everything they could buy. And Montanans, obviously, at some point managed, despite the bought legislature, yeah. to pass Probably this populist era, yes, guess, protective yeah. legislation. So they said our law should stay. I mean— It's our law. It doesn't have anything to do with the federal elections. It has to do with the way we do our elections. The Supreme Court, and in fact, came down saying, as we said, 
in yeah. Citizens United. Right. They not on, they underscored right. their citizens. That's Some right. people said maybe with now that they're seeing what Citizens United has wrought yeah. with the super PACs and all this crap, maybe this would give them an opportunity to, to just back off a little bit. Back off? Well, I think, yeah. I find this so unbelievable. I think the thing that's most interesting to me about it is, I mean, this is <laughs> the same day that ruling got handed down, the immigration ruling got handed down. And what, uh, and of course, the big thing that's of the moment and the buzz is about is, is, is Scalia's dissent, where he rails about the importance of respecting sovereign states and states' rights. In regard to immigration. In regard to immigration. Flip that over. The same day they hand down a ruling that says, screw your state's rights when it comes to the conduct of elections. You can't do this. Uh, uh, there was just a, a t- today's Post Has Gazette. Has gone off the rails? Yeah, I think, I think generally, I mean, you know, if you look at some of the precedents he cited, one of the He's things all was, over the place. Back in the good old days, he, one of his things back in the good old days, states used to be able to make it really difficult for black people to travel. That's right. You know, you know Both. original yeah, intent. Yeah. So, you know, similarly, you have Alito um, dissenting from the, the, the other ruling that I think people are kind of upbeat about is the um, no more uh, life without parole for, yes, for, for juvenile juveniles. offenders. Right. And Alito, in his dissent, says, you know, maybe maybe attitudes are changing, but why is the judiciary any better positioned? But the judiciary is not well positioned to say what people's attitudes are and what social attitudes are. That's a job for the legislature. Well, if that's true, then how can you then submit sub- substitute your judgment in for Citizens United or, 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 or the original Citizens United case where they said, and the, the justices said, we don't think it's likely that people will see corruption here. They substituted their political judgment. They did exactly what Alito in this dissent said they shouldn't do. So they basically, they just, I mean, this is what lawyers call outcome-based this is these are outcome based rulings. Okay. These are there's these are you don't totally have a legal principle. Po- so you you have a result that you want and then you build a principle okay, so to justify. The, these guys are just totally yeah. Yeah. totally political. It is it is almost impossible to come to any other conclusion. I saw, somebody said, you know, what what's with Scalia is he auditioning for a uh, a talk show on Fox because that's where he should be now. Yeah. 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 He's actually got the personality for it. He's perfect. He'd be great. <laughs> he's a blow. No, he's, he'd be great. Absolutely sure of himself. He's never wrong. Right. He doubt O'Reilly O'Reilly. Yeah. He's exactly, yeah. no, he's perfect. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it is, and you look at these guys, and, and what's funny, too, is there used to be a time, and it wasn't so long ago, you know, I, I, for example, tomorrow, if this ruling comes down, I'm looking forward to being able to join with the Tea Party and oppose judicial activism. Because if you go and you look at, say, the Pittsburgh Tea Party, they have their Tea Party Declaration of Independence. And one of the things they say is, we are opposed to the judiciary substituting their judgment and imposing their judgment on the other branches well, of government. <laughs> so, fine. I'm against that, too, if that's how it's going to be. I mean, it's just amazing to see these things like well, states' rights or it. judicial restraint. All of that stuff go out the window. Right. You know, all these supposed principles that we've been hearing them blather on about for decades. And now, 5-4 majority, screw all that. We'll take it to court. We're going to take it to court. God. So anyway, the, the, this juvenile uh, uh, thing really hits at Pennsylvania. We yeah. have apparently Pennsylvania has more children serving yeah. life sentences, or at least we're technically children when they were sentenced to life right. than any other state. It's how you keep the young people from leaving. <laughs> It's youth retention. <laughs> we built PNC Park. That didn't work, so we decided to build another yeah, prison in we'll Green just County. Keep them in. <laughs> See how greater for you. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay, yeah. so this thing tomorrow. You want to place any bets? Is it going to be mixed? Hold up this. Strike down that. It's not going to be full, but they'll they'll take the gut out. They'll take the mandatory. Um, Right. You know, that's the great thing about this court. You, you just can't go. tell. Anything can happen. There's no there's no there's no reason to think there's no reason to think yesterday's logic will apply tomorrow. That's like that's okay, like that's what we're right. Saying. So you don't know. I mean you know, I should we should say, by the way, there's a there's a theory out there which I think is interesting that in a way the best thing that could happen for Obama and the Democrats is that they Strike throw out totally they, oh no, actually it's just that they throw out the individual mandate. Well, I think that is what they might do. So, so, but there's an argument that that actually wouldn't necessarily be bad for Democrats. Why? Obama can go and say, "Look at all this stuff that's still in the bill that we brought for you. Most of those things are very popular." 
and of course, you're right that the that the thing tends to fall apart. It does. It won't work. So, but then whose problem does that become? All of a sudden, you're going to have a lot of insurance companies who basically have been on the sidelines of this battle, and all of a sudden, they're going to have to start making a fuss about it. And it'll be interesting to see whose head they come down on, because at this point, you would have to say the responsible group here are the Republicans. So, in a way, the the politics of this may not be quite as disastrous as as people think, at least in the short term, which, um, you know, basically matters. Well, but you're talking from a political point of view. Yes, I am talking from a political point of view. Let's talk about the reality, which is um, this country cannot, is totally dysfunctional. It cannot cannot address any of its major problems. Yeah, Yeah, no question. I mean, and the, the irony of this whole thing just throughout has just been so many of the objections that have been raised to it. Are objections that would never have applied to a single payer program, and a single payer program is politically impossible. Well, that is true. So that's the, that. Is, this, is, this is why we can't have nice things. And <laughs> also, no, and also, let us not uh, forget that essentially this Obamacare is is uh, is an idea that came out of right. the conservative think tanks. Was first put in place by a Republican governor named Mitt friggin' Romney in right. Massachusetts. Right. It's a Republican idea. Right. Right. But let's not again let facts get in the right. way or history or reality get in the way of... Uh, uh, so I just want to say, when there's Medicare for all and <laughs> and we're all living in the socialist workers' paradise... You only have yourselves to blame. That's right. Because you had a chance to keep all the wealthy people in their place and all the insurance executives fat and happy, and you blew it. Well, according to a Gallup poll, uh, only one-third of Americans can correctly identify Barack Obama as a Christian. Mm. One-third. Does that mean the rest think he's something else, or they just don't know? No, they, the rest think he's something else. Oh, I don't know. Uh, let me see. Eleven percent say he's a Muslim. Oh, I'm surprised it's not higher. <laughs> Fox News, get on it. Come on, you're not poisoning you quite enough it. minds. Um, <laughs> and believe it or not, uh, there are some, and I don't know what the percentage is, who think he's a Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it begins with M. <laughs> I don't know. Some might be a Methodist. I uh... nobody thinks he's a Jew, but um, <laughs> nobody. I really and I, yeah, not I, even margin of error. Not even. No, 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 no. People. I take umbrage at that. Nobody answered Jew. Yeah. I thought um, it was like the Sammy Davis Jr. or something. Yeah. So I guess, but that shows. So wait, I, what does that show, leave? That was that okay. Thirty-three percent. Eleven. That's fifty-five. Um, I've thrown a few. It, it's about. Um, Forty-four so yeah. percent do not. Oh, okay. Don't know. Don't have a clue. Didn't have an answer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, what does that tell you about the American people? Um, most of us are are either ignorant or apathetic, which I guess I kind of knew before. <laughs> well, what I find is that most people pay absolutely no attention. Yeah. yeah. None. Yeah. yeah. None. Yeah. They don't have a clue what's yeah. going on. Which is why, you know, you listen to these damn ads that are just starting up. We're going right. to be so polluted right. by them. And, you know, you laugh. at my, my son just makes fun. Everyone that comes on, Democrat or Republican, he starts making fun of them no matter what. It, it, and that's what they do. They breed absolute right. cynicism. Right. Um, and most people, because they don't read a newspaper, they don't really, they don't even listen to f- Fox. They, yeah. don't, they yeah. don't listen to anything. They just... Go about doing whatever it is they're doing. Right. And uh, so those ads have an impact. I wonder what the world's like for that. Like for that. I keep somebody trying to think that. that. What is it? Like I, you, I, just, you must just sort of like wander through reality like some ancient Sumerian or something who just sort of believes the world is moved by these strange causes. And, you just you know, simply, you just, I mean, it's such a, it's a world lived in such right. a small right. bubble. Because right. it's only what's in your immediate. I, mean, I I don't know. I don't understand it. How sad, actually. Yeah. And it's On the sad. other hand, they probably know a lot more about Brangelina than you and I do. So who are we to say? <laughs> well, you I think you're so up, smart, Lynn Collins. I can But you don't know on, anything about the Real Housewives. Well, that's not. Tr- well, that's true. But I I can keep up on a lot of that crap. I can. Yeah. Yeah. Well. 
looking down your nose at the honest American worker. <laughs> Brings home a paycheck. See, this is just this is why you and I can't run for office ever because we just did that. <laughs> what? Because we're, we're, oh, we're elitists. We're elitists. Yeah. Listen, it's not elitist to ask an American who it's gets a, all of this, your rights, you get all of your whatever it is, this life you're living in your little bubble. You get that. You're asked only one thing to vote. That's the only thing you're asked to do. And in order to vote, you have to pay attention. Because if there's one thing our founding fathers told us, guys, this ain't going to work, this thing we're giving you. It will not work without an informed citizenry. And if you can't do that much, then you are destroying this country. Actually, I think they said you can't you can't do it without a landed citizenry because you. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> so too. we should be careful about what uh, what intention. No, we but they were right about a democracy not working without an informed right. voting. Oh, yes, absolutely. The voters. Yeah. yeah. And what we have is clueless voters and or misinformed voters and a very little little bit of people who are actually trying to seek out information. Right. Jesus Christ. What I, is the latest with Brangelina, by the way? You should Google that. They're going to get married. I'm searching for information here. They're, they're getting, getting married. married. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. Huh. They're getting married. Isn't that nice? So I, I actually didn't realize they weren't married before. See, I'm... Well, nobody gets married now. You have to have at least six children, then you get married. No, no. I thought you... I thought everybody got married, and then they just... No, 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 no. Marriage is on its way out. Oh, I see. That's why gays can do it now, because it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> I'm ta- Britney Spears. That's right. right. No, I'm... <laughs> I'm taking a break. Email your questions and comments to lynn at pghcitypaper.com or call Lynn at 412-316-3381. Lynn Cullen Live will return in a moment. Vote now. Who will be the chosen one in Pittsburgh City Paper's annual Best of Readers poll and register to win a new iPad? Pittsburgh City Paper, available at over 1,700 locations throughout western Pennsylvania and on the web at pghcitypaper.com and on your smartphone at citypapermobile.com. You in the city and Hosanna House Summer Nights present Jazz Under the Stars, starring Najee, Friday, July 13th. 8 p.m. at the Sherwood Event Center in Wilkinsburg. Tickets available at Dorsey's, Stettiford's, or charge by phone at 1-800-383-5760. Naji live in concert July 13th. Proceeds benefit Hosanna House, a place called hope. Bergbargains.com for great deals on tickets to the Science Center, Symphony, History Museum, and the Carnegie Museums. Check out this week's big deal featuring 50% off tickets to En Vogue at Heinz Hall on June 29th. Bergbargains.com, Pittsburgh's only online deal site where the deals don't expire. Bergbargains.com. Bella wants to thank all of southwestern Pennsylvania, the USA, and the world for helping to liberate his native country of Equatorial Guinea. Equatorial Guinea has suffered 43 years of dictatorship, 43 years of human rights abuses, 43 years of corruption, and 43 years of kleptocracy. Even with $5 billion in oil revenue in 2011, the 700,000 citizens of Equatorial Guinea earn less than $2 per day. A proud Mount Lebanon resident, please help Gustavo and Vela usher in the 21st century by allowing freedom, democracy, and socioeconomic prosperity by the rule of law for the next 43 years and beyond. Email him at presidentandvela at yahoo.com to help free Equatorial Guinea. Now, it's back to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. Oh, God almighty. (laughs) Look, I have my notice of the uh, Green Bay Packer uh, shareholder shareholder meeting. meeting. Mm. Rain or shine, Lambeau Field, 930, July 24th. Uh, is this is you elect board members, or well, there is they, there oh, is yeah, always that, but then there's some other stuff too. Have you ever run for a board position? No, mm. no, I wouldn't get it. And by the way, who, like are the people who I, who I have board to board tell members? you, I'm looking at this and, and oh no 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 okay. no, they're, they're they're people I went to high school. Oh, there's an Olson. <laughs> oh hey, there's there's got to be at least one Olson on the board. I think that's probably actually they're not very Green Bay like Nick Kunkel. That's a Green there's, Bay yeah, name, so. and Cress is definitely yeah. that's a big name in Green Bay and Keene. And um, there's only one woman, the old Susan Finkel. Hmm. Hmm. I'm protesting and only voting for Susan. 
Really? Good for you. Yeah. You know, yeah, you get these kinds of things from, you know, maybe a, you don't even know you own something in a mutual fund or something, yeah. and you do get a, a proxy. Right. And they're always telling you, here's who we recommend to vote. I, al- I, never, used, forever else. I never used to send those in. Mm-hmm. I send them in really? now. I vote against right. everybody they want. <laughs> Anybody the corporation is saying I should vote for, I say, fuck them. I'm not. You think I'm some... You just write a Noam Chomsky yeah, for your... You yeah. think I'm some kind of a puppet? Ralph Nader. That jumps when you say jump? So... Hey, so Chelsea Wagner, I'm rooting for her. She's, huh? she's really going after, and so are some of these other ladies that we... You see... The, the problem with politics around here is we've been electing guys all this time. All of a sudden, we get some women in here. You got that Rudiak, you got this uh, Wagner, and they're all they're, they're feisty little things, well, aren't they? Well, Are they is ahead? the issue uh, the the not the tax exempt nonprofits? Uh, yes. You well, I'm just no, I'll just I, while I support what they're doing. I mean, this is yes. not the first time it's happened, and there's a, there's a million a long, years. There's a long know. line of also. I mean, generally, I agree with you, but. Um, politicians of all stripes have raised these issues. I got a feeling we're getting to a kind of a point where the populace is about ready to uh, get behind these efforts. Do you, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. You don't see, and I haven't been watching a lot of TV because we have a kid now, but it seems to me I don't see as many UPMC ads as there used to be. Is that true or is that just me because I'm not watching much? I, I'd be I don't watch much to, either. I don't know. I'd be sort of curious whether anybody else. You might a, be right that it, it seems like they it's kind a of little backed bit off down. A little bit just... down. And maybe that was all because the, the fight with Heimer. Oh, yeah. Well, that, no, no question. But even those ads that were just like the. The violins. Know, this is not a hospital. It is a song to the potential. Uh, that's right. Yeah, anyway. So, yes. Uh, Wagner and, uh, and Rudy Ack, of course, council, city council um, had a. Meeting about this yesterday, um, well, and Wagner at the county level is also making a challenge. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Anyway, the first edition, first edition, first edition, the last edition. No, no, the most recent edition. Let's not. Oh, you're right. That would be correct. I don't. <laughs> Unless you know something I don't. No, I do not. <laughs> I'll go back up and my desk will be clean. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> That'll be something, yeah. They're going to have to bring <laughs> no, they'll it. Just, they'll just hit it with a flamethrower. Yeah. <laughs> the, it's most um, of the pictures of my kid now, anyways. <laughs> the most recent edition of Pittsburgh City Paper. This one will get picked up as opposed to last week's with all those boring white men on it. This one has a term. We're jag off right there on the it cover. It says jag off. Which is, by the way, a term I had never heard in my life. Until you came here. Until I came to Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And I immediately sort of got the meaning. I just thought it meant a jerk. Yeah. Is that correct? More or less, yeah. Okay. An annoying person. Yeah, you're a jagger. Yeah, Yeah, so that's what I thought. And so why do you have Jagoff on the cover of Pittsburgh's (laughs) paper? Um, Partly as a a joke. Um, The Post-Gazette a few weeks ago. um, So you're goading the Post-Gazette. Yes, a a little bit, but that's where it started. Post-Gazette's executive editor, David Tribbins, sent out a memo um, uh, uh, at the end of May um, asserting that the Post-Gazette now has a no Jagoff policy. The word should not appear in its articles. Um, online or anywhere else. Doesn't David um, have something better to do? You know, I mean, that's, that could be a, that could <laughs> can be you a imagine, great... Can you imagine what uh, all the wags at the, uh, yes, in and, the newsroom were and, saying? And he had no problem, actually. What's great is he wrote this He wrote this memo, and the last line of it is, have fun making fun of this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he knows he knows what he's going to get. Yeah. Um, and it just it kind of got me what interested. What a because, jag off. Because right. I think for a lot of people, although I don't think Shribbin is one of them, a, a lot of people think that jag off is, is vague obscene. They think Why? it refers to jacking off or something like that. A lot of people oh, tend to believe oh, that. Oh, oh, and it actually has nothing to do with that. It, it Like so many of our words, including um, yin's, uh, dates to um, Scotland and to the northern British Isles. Um, and it just it's, it's a, to jag is to poke or to prod or to annoy. So this is why we call thorn bushes jag Jaggers, bushes, for example. Which, by the way, nobody else does either. Yeah, exactly. Because again, it comes from that same root okay. or whatever. But it's one of those words that's this sort of misunderstood. You know, it's become kind of misunderstood. Um, and in in the piece that sort of accompanies that story, I talked to Barbara Johnstone, who's the sort of foremost scholar of Pittsburgh 
um, linguistics, yes. Pittsburghese. Um, you know, and, and she talks quite a bit um, about how there's this sort of tension between old Pittsburgh and new Pittsburgh, and how you know Pittsburgh's kind of modish right now. You know, it's the hot city or whatever, um, and so you have a lot of people sort of using trying to co-opt portions of the local dialect to sort of demonstrate a little bit of, you know, urban cool or whatever, you know? So if you go, like, you'll drive... And what Bumper guys? Sticks. What do you mean? Oh, all kinds of guys. Oh, so if Annette? you drive, you see the Anat stickers or you know, whatever. That was one, that's one of my listeners who came up with Really? That. Well, yeah. congratulations to, to that fellow. We actually, when I was at In Pittsburgh, that's we Jack. had... We had a, um, and this is back in 1995, we had a column, and it was called, I can't remember what it was, but it was basically an internet... Like we, it was when the internet was starting, <laughs> and we had a thing. It was called like something like Pittsburgh and at, and, the, uh-huh. and with the at sign because of course that was the email use or whatever. So the, that goes back a ways. Um, but at any rate, this idea that people kind of look at this stuff and they and they kind of celebrate it. You know, there's that Pittsburgh Dad YouTube thing, which frankly I don't really get what the point, like the big deal is, but whatever. And it's this idea of sort of capturing and sort of playing on this sort of local quirkiness or whatever, and we sort of get nostalgic for this past that we don't even fully understand at this point. It's already being lost to us. Um, so I thought that that was kind of like an interesting, uh, kind of an interesting thing. But, but you know, we put on the cover because we wanted to put Jag off on the cover. And Weren't you the one, were you the one that was railing uh, a week ago or two weeks ago about all this you're getting sick and tired of all this celebratory crap about, I, oh, know, Pittsburgh, oh, you know, all the icons, oh, Mr. Rogers, oh, this, oh, there that. Is a, there, is a, there is a level at which, yeah, this is after this is after we were on the air and you had your, your guest here. Um, there, is a, there is a point at which I do sometimes feel like if I hear one more person talk about the French fries on the sandwich, I'm just going to blow my brains out. <laughs> there's, just, there's just a level. At, at some point, and I say this in the article, there's a point at which you talk about you can only talk about your authenticity, which we all do here. Pittsburgh, it's so authentic. It's so Let me authentic. tell you. You, you can only what? talk about your authenticity for so long before it starts to not be authentic do you, anymore. Do you know what? And But here's the other thing. As somebody who's lived in other places. Sure, yeah. Every community. <laughs> yeah, what, like, what do we think? Guys, a bunch of fakers everywhere else? Yeah, what? I mean, excuse me. Cleveland, we're the bullshit. friendly only in Pittsburgh. If right. somebody asks you for directions, will you yeah, get in your Yeah, exactly. You know, that's not true. Yeah. Guys, it's not true. Some of the friendliest, like, strangers I've met have been in New York City. Yeah, that's right. The streets of Manhattan. Some of the nicest people. I mean, I think that of people in Wisconsin. Nicest, regular, non-pretentious, just regular old have a beer with me people. Yeah, they're there too. Right. They have bars in many different cities. yeah, they do. (laughs) And alcohol makes people friendly (laughs) all around the world. So that's why... That's what bugs me about it. Yeah, it's not that it, there's not some tr- there's not truth in it, of course, but this sense that only here, give me a break. I think part of it. I think part of it stems from defensiveness. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of it stems from defensiveness because we were, you know, we were kicked down, we were right. kicked down and looked down upon for a while. Right, right. I think part of it too, also, there's a certain kind of fetish for it because so many people who lived here moved away, and they get nostalgic for what they left behind. There's a sort of expatriate and what they community. know and what right, makes exactly. them feel comfortable. So, 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 so ways in which the city develops or changes or whatever, they're not necessarily aware of. They have this sort of perfectly right. crystalline vision of this of of the place, and they become kind of fun. Fundamentalist about it, you know. I, a friend of mine um, gr- uh, spent her childhood in Greece, but moved um, to the United States, and says that when she was a girl, and she says that actually, Greek Orthodox religious practice here is much more conventional than it is in Greece itself, because what they've done is they took it over with them and they kept it exactly the same because it was a connection back. Whereas in Greece itself, they're already connected, so things change because they, they can. So in some ways, we're sort of being well, held I hostage. Think that, I think that, that's by right. the People who no longer and it's live here. Tr- that it's true of. M- more ethnic enclaves. Yes. It's not yeah. Oh, yeah, just absolutely. the Greeks. I mean, oh, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, just an example, the way right? Italians are Italian here, right. the way whatever right. Slovakians are Slovakian right. here. If you take someone from Italy and bring them here, they'll think, what the hell are you guys doing? Right, right, This exactly. was like, you know, this is 19th century stuff. What are yeah. you doing? Yeah. Right. It's true. So we're like a little time capsule in right. that way. And, 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 so much, and since so much of that identity or whatever is being defined by me- media accounts that are sort of reflecting that stuff, you, you do sort of end up being held hostage to... Yeah, it just becomes self-perpetuating right. and there's no way to get out of it. Right. And I don't know. I mean, not I to say know. there aren't friendly Pittsburghers, but let's face it, there are a lot of jagoffs too. That's why we use the word. <laughs> that, right. <laughs> right? Yeah, if everybody no. in Pittsburgh was that friendly and that terrific, can we say the word jag-off? jagoff would no longer be in our vocabulary, <laughs> would it? <laughs> oh, hey, I got to tell you what a, what, what a good Pittsburgh deed I did yesterday, because <gasps> it was an interesting 
experience. Now, so now this is a Pittsburgh deed, as distinguished from a kindly deed that any Wisconsin No, I would have done have this done? anywhere. Okay, all right. I'm standing at the bus stop uh, after the show and, um, you know, waiting for my bus. As people do. As people do. And I see it down there, but at the same time I see it, uh, a very t- I realize there's like a sort of a presence on my on my side, and I turn, and it's a, a woman, maybe about 50-ish, and she's foreign. Uh, she's not Caucasian. I'm not sure what she is. Mm-hmm. I took her for Mexican. <laughs> I took her for an illegal <laughs> immediately. Because she said to she me. She called the police over. In like very broken, I mean, she showed me this piece of paper and said, you know, like, can you help Bus? What? She wanted to get to this place, and she didn't know how. And it was like the Pittsburgh Job Corps gymnasium uh, for a graduation ceremony oh. at 2.30. And it said Highland Drive, and it was an 06 zip. And I thought, 06? Oh, That's Liberty. East Liberty. And I, but I was thinking Highland. Maybe they meant Highland Avenue. Is that 06? Highland Park? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I could, well, well, I don't know because Island they sort Avenue of like goes go, through that area. Yeah, yeah. So I got, I said, gee whiz, I don't know where this is and I don't know what bus. And I said, here, and, I, and then I saw there was a phone number. I said, here, let me, let me, you know, I'm doing all this. You know, how you start talking louder. Sure. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. <laughs> let me call. So I call this number. Meanwhile, I see my bus come. I see my bus go. I'm thinking, oh, shit. So um, here's my number. Buzz, 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 buzz. Hello, you have reached the number. I said, can't, can't get anywhere with that. So then I realized I have a smartphone. And if it's good wow, for anything, wow. I could, like, look up Pittsburgh Job Corps gymnasium which i did and bang oh up comes some information and da 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 and i got another phone number and i said blah, 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 wait and i called and of course went through you know press one press two press three press four press five press six press wait eight. was it press one for espanol because that would have been really ironic yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I, no but then you could... turned to her and you said god i can't stand waiting for this spanish language <laughs> <laughs> And she was looking very concerned, and every right. once in a while, I mean, she looked like, ICD yeah, like, what is yeah. she doing? And and <laughs> I kept saying, wait, wait, I mean, and blah, 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 and I get a woman, and I say, I have a woman here who's trying to get to the blah, 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 and how do you get there from downtown on a bus? Ah, oh, geez, I don't know. <laughs> well, Thanks for your help. Hey, let me, here was a Pittsburgh moment. Let me find someone who can help you. And then she disappears and is gone for hours. <laughs> I thought, oh, she's down there. And then someone gets on. And I said, so how do you? And she says, oh, that's really easy. You get you get on the P1 or the P2. The bus then that you, you get were off, waiting for yeah, that right. had gone Then you get the off at East Liberty. Yeah, then sure. you get on the 74, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. That'll take you right over. I'm thinking, how is this poor woman supposed to get off one, transfer to another, find the right place. I don't know, but I said, I was able to say to her, come with me, we go on P1, P1, P1. (laughs) So so, um, we waited about 10 more minutes and along comes the P1, we got on it. And we're sitting there together, and you know, there's this discomfort when you can't yeah, really yeah, um, yeah, of course. communicate. But she, there's also discomfort when you can, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but she tried. She yes. would say thank. She would say, she told me thank you. Uh, English no good. Blah blah blah. This that. I said, oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. We'll get you there. Don't worry. Blah blah blah. And um, anyway. We get off together at, and I said, I'll walk you, we'll find this other bus stop. I couldn't find it. <laughs> I, I 
<laughs> this poor woman. This woman is really not, hitched her wagon yeah, to a star I, here. This woman is following me across the busway in these Liberty, around the corner. I'm stopping people. Where's the 70? I don't know. And then I thought. They all start using their smartphones <laughs> to help you. Pretty soon then there's I like thought, a line of 12 of you I, just oh trying God, to. Make... It was ridiculous. And this woman was looking increasingly nervous. And then I, I was thinking, you know, she was trusted. I'm yeah. a stranger. Yes. Totally trusting that I'm going to help her here. I could be setting her up to yeah. God knows what. <laughs> so, which we were talking about the other day, how Americans don't trust uh, strangers enough to That's like true. maybe go off That's with right. them like she did. Yeah. And I kept saying, you're very brave. I said to her, you're very brave. That probably uh, made her even more I, concerned, I, of course. <laughs> and then I realized, <laughs> wait a minute. I parked my car near here. <laughs> oh, God's sake, Colin. What? <laughs> so you t- so you rode her over. I said, yes. I have a car. A car. <laughs> Come. She probably thought that was. <laughs> that's actually American Sign Language for. <laughs> I'm a drum major. Right. <laughs> Come. Come. Come to the car. The car. <laughs> oh, wait. Wait, get it. <laughs> And I, by then, had had this idea that I think I know where Highland Drive is. Yes. I think that's where the Schumann Center is. Yes, I believe you're right. Right, right. And I know where I've seen signs of Schumann. I mean, I've heard. Yeah. (laughs) So, oh, my God. So we get to Highland, and then I can't find it, and I end up at a VA, and and nobody there knows. And then I go back, and I end up in Lincoln Leamington, and then we come back again, and I end up at God knows where. And this woman is, like, sitting there (laughs) thinking, Meanwhile, the ceremony ended no, 20 minutes ago. No, because she started out so okay. early. It wasn't Smart until 2.30. Yeah. Okay, yeah. whatever. By now it's 12.30. Right. Anyway, we managed to converse in all of this a little bit. Right. You know where she was from? Wichita. <laughs> <laughs> Bhutan. Oh, yes. Bhutan. Bhutan. Mm-hmm. Isn't that interesting? And ethnically, I thought she looked like a South American Indian. Right. Well, but, just like well, Jan Brewer, the governor of uh, Arizona, wait, wait, thought all of those Latinos yeah. looked like they might be Asian. Oh, God. But so I know something about Bhutan. I said, Bhutan, you have king. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> India, <laughs> Nepal. <laughs> Nepal. Yes, yes. And I found out that she and her family were farmers. Millet, maize, mm-hmm. rice. Oh. Um, maize, that's what the Bhutanese call corn. That's right. <laughs> Very um, hard life. Sure, yeah. But Bhutan is the country where the king decreed that the way to measure the nation's success was not gross national product or gross domestic product. It was a thing he came up with called the GHI, Gross Happiness Index, because he's Buddhist. Yes. And I remember reading about that and thinking, oh, how nice. But then I thought, well, heck, if the king's into happiness, what's this poor woman doing in my car? <laughs> Why would she have had to run? Did you ask? I could, that was too complicated yeah. to get into. But when I got home, I did get into. I got on the internet and did Bhutan, and there is there was uh, sort of minority conflict with some in the south right, uh, right. ending up in refugee camps. Uh, she's see, got and the United States agreeing to take sixty thousand of right. these Bhutanese in. No. So she's one of those, along with her three children. Her youngest was the one being graduated. All three have jobs. Right. There you go. Well, sounds like we got rid of, got to get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> you so, know, maybe, but, maybe, maybe the Bhutanese, the Bhutanese idea of being happy is riding around in cars with strange women. <laughs> like you could have actually added to the Bhutanese <laughs> general happiness index by. <laughs> but you know what? So anyway, I drop her off finally. And the minute I turned the car around to get home, I started crying. Oh, no, it's nice. You know yeah, what? it's this weird connection. You realize, no, what people go oh, through in their lives. Here yeah. she was, probably about 10 years younger than me. She had uprooted herself from everything she knew, her right. language, her culture. 
and had come halfway around the world and has the that takes unbelievable courage and then the courage she's told me she lived in Bellevue she somehow managed to get on the bus get from Bellevue to downtown where she's on a street corner and doesn't and trying to get to this place where she would have to have had taken two more buses and she has this beautiful smile and she, I, conversely she met a celebrity well, she doesn't know that. Well, yeah, I know, but that's even better. She's going to go back someday and say the Americans, they're a kindly but tall and loud-spoken people. <laughs> tall and loud. Loud-spoken. They gesture a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so now I, yeah. I can't get her out of my head. So it was for one of her daughters, their graduation? Her youngest daughter, who was 22, and she's, um, yeah, graduating from some program there. And she said she had managed to let me know that her daughter had wanted her to come to the graduation, and she didn't know if she could get there, so I think she was surprising her. But see, yeah, that's great. Like, that's a nice, that's a good thing. Like, I understand what you're saying, but on the other hand, her three kids have jobs. Oh, I know, I know, I know. That's what it's all about. So, I mean, I'm, I'm practically... Good luck to you in this country. May your family be... You know, I was... That's probably the scariest part of the whole day for her. <laughs> My God, I thought she was going to hug me. I did. I no, you did hug her? Yeah, but I hugged her. <laughs> and then I thought... I almost kissed her. I almost took her home. I didn't a, know what to a do. Demonstrative people, take, the Americans. Oh, God. And then I thought later, maybe that was really wrong. You know, Bhutanese might not touch yeah, each other. Right. And then I thought, oh, God, what yeah. did I do? I don't know. We got to take a break. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> More is on the way with Lynn Cullen Live. Get Lynn Cullen Live on your smartphone. Go to citypapermobile.com now for Pittsburgh City Paper's brand new mobile app. Get the latest restaurant reviews, event listings, movie times, and of course, Lynn Collin live on your smartphone. CityPaperMobile.com. Hey, Billy, want to go to the state fair? Yeah! Well, you can't. Huh? Well, you see, Billy, when you throw away money on wasted electricity, you throw away everything you could have done with it. But now your parents are becoming energy efficient. They could save hundreds of dollars a year and take you to the fair next year. I want to go now. I know you do. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy and the Ad Council. Pittsburgh City Paper is seeking 10 local artists to design their own street box for a public art project to be featured throughout the city of Pittsburgh. Go to pghcitypaper.com and click on the Art Box link for more details. The Pittsburgh City Paper Art Box Project, brought to you by McDonald's. Now, it's back to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. <laughs> you can't read that one out. Why? Oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. Margaret, you, you scamp. You scamp. That's a good one. <laughs> Margaret writes, gee, I thought the lady would be from Equatorial Guinea. <laughs> <laughs> Having escaped its klepto- kleptocracy. 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 Yes. It's a good Don't word. say that. Okay. Well, now. <laughs> Is there anything you want to talk about? Because I have one other thing here. I think I actually want to talk about the same thing you want to talk about. The Duquesne means, thing? Yes. Are you I wrote aware about it, it made week. the New York Times? Yes, I was. Over the weekend, I believe. Yeah. This is the gentle guys, the guy we had on the show the other day, the bow-tied, very eloquent uh, gent, Dr. Robin Sowards. Mm-hmm. Sword, I forgot how he pronounced it. Sowards. Um, he ended up in a, woo, almost, is that a third of a page? No. In the New York Times, his picture and a whole... Uh, Article. It's more. It's not an article as much as an. Uh, what do you call these things? Would that be? A, it's an article, yeah. but it's a little bit of an op Yeah, it's it, it, it's a bruising. It's a pretty bruising take, actually. Okay, I agree. So in this piece, um, headline for Duquesne professors: a union fight that transcends religion. It's about what we've talked about a number of times: the effort on the part of the adjunct professors at Duquesne to unionize. Uh, and join the Steelworkers Union because they're just getting screwed at Duquesne. Uh, not paid a living wage, no benefits, no security, no nothing. And Duquesne is fighting them tooth and nail. And oh my God, this is in um, this is written by 
every Saturday there's a, a piece about an, uh, some subject that fits into a religious over. Lay. So they, it often talks about morality and morals. And let me tell you, Duquesne University comes up on the wrong end of this piece. Yeah, it's, and rightfully so. And rightfully so. <laughs> it's brutal. Uh, Duquesne arguing somehow. There was a, even, remember the letter or the op-ed piece in the PG written by some idiot saying that Duquesne's religious freedom, yeah. yet again. I talked was, to that idiot, by the way. God, was yeah. under attack. Yeah. Under attack because this of uh, this attempt to union, unionize. Um, and anyway, here here's a good paragraph. Duquesne's case was never a strong one. The university is barely religious, as the union pointed out in its brief. The university does not depend financially on the Catholic Church, does not require its faculty members to be Catholic, and does not require students to study Catholicism. What's more, the university was asking yeah. for an after-the-fact religious exemption yes. from a contract it had freely signed, yeah. the agreement that set the terms of the union <clears throat> election. Um, but then it starts arguing, oh, our Catholic religion. And anyway, they even have their, it, well, you go ahead. It is, what is going on there? I mean, that they went this way. What happened to them? They have other unions They on do. And, and actually, my understanding is their relationship with those other unions is it's pretty good. good. pretty decent. Uh, we should also mention, I don't think this is in the Times story, but it's in the column that I wrote about this. Most of the, most um, city um Catholic schools, grade schools, Central Catholic and Oakland Catholic, they are the teacher, the faculty there are unionized, um, and yet, as far as I know, nobody's teach, teaching Wicca um, at Central Catholic. So, you know, I, the school's representation, um, the president uh, Charles Doherty sent out an email to the campus, and what he said his concern was is great. There's some great stuff in there. You know, for one thing, he says, "Let us all proceed forward, making assumptions of good faith all around." This after, and again, this, the key part of this for me really is the line you read. What's more, the university was asking for an was asking for an after the fact religious exemption from a contract it had signed. It's not just asking to be let out of government oversight or whatever. It's asking to be let out of, of its a own promise agreement, it made. a promise, of its it own made. promise. Yeah. And and what I say in this article is this isn't about freedom of conscience. It's about freedom from it. This is about them wanting to be let off of any standard, including the standard they put on themselves when they agreed to go forward with this election. Right. Um. So you know, but the schools. So of course. So after you do that, then you're going to want to say, let's stick good faith all around. Well, it's too late for that. You've already squandered your ability to, to be credited with good faith because you've gone back on your word. Um, but what he says in there is he, he was concerned that the steel workers would somehow infringe on the school's right to set curriculum requirements or graduation or whatever, which, which even the steel workers, bullshit. you know, I talked to the steel workers attorney, Dan Cavallo, who just said that that's a management prerogative. Even if we tried to bring that forward, the NLRB, you know, probably wouldn't let us do it. And anyway, this isn't about that. This is about wages and health benefits and job security. Those are the three things this is about. The school says, um, and its defenders uh, will say, look, you know, sure, the Pope said that stuff about unions. Oh, but yeah, the Catholic Church is always the main thing yeah, is right. The main thing is workers' right. dignity, and we promise to pay these guys better, you know, down the road. Like we'll we'll do we'll do right by them. It's just like well, oh yeah, you've you know really... nobody no you know the other thing is thing says is you know we had no idea they were going to unionize. We the first time we read about this was in the newspaper. <laughs> well, that is such. I mean that's crap. that's what Doherty says. This is wow. the first time we knew about this was in the newspapers. He's lying. It's a it's a it's a remarkable it's a remarkable email. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean I just I, I think it's you know. What they will say is, look, this isn't about unions per se. It's about government interference. I talked to the guy who wrote this guy from the John Newman Society who wrote that op-ed you mentioned. I, I talked to him myself, and he said, you know, he said, you know, they could have a union there, and it wouldn't affect their religious thing. This is about whether government should be in the position of, you know, meddling in how the school operates itself, which is in its well, government. Go and, and, and the thing is, you could have, as Duquesne, you could have voluntarily recognized this union outside of that government jurisdiction because you had 50% plus one of your guys. Of you your didn't faculty. have to involve. So you, could have, you could have right. accepted that voluntarily. Right. right. But you did not. Which brought the NLRB, the feds, in. Right. 
right. by law. The other thing that's going on here as well, and I think that I think the Times story mentions this too, is, is that they chucked they chucked the the guy who'd been representing them in their other labor disputes was a local firm, yes. and they got rid of that guy for some dude down in Tennessee who specializes in keeping workplaces union free, who also represents one and I think maybe two other Catholic universities who are also fighting this stuff. Um, so he is, and in fact. Um, He's just copying and pasting That's right. objections from those other things. And you know, and there's a theory out there that says what this is really about is it's you know, they obviously they don't necessarily want to pay the adjuncts any more money than they than they have to. I mean, they're like any other employer in that respect. But what's also going on here is, is that there's clearly a move within the Catholic hierarchy. We saw it with Obamacare and the right, contraception right, rule right. um to sort of to get behind the rights of the employer at the expense of the rights what of the employee. What is that? So they're, it's like they're joining the Because they're employers themselves. The re- yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, two things. One, they're employers themselves. And two, you know, there's a credible argument that American Catholicism is, has been shaped by the fact that, the, that so much of the, of the rise of religiosity in this country is coming to, to go into the evangelical right, who talks about sex issues, as we know, all the time. And that in some ways, in, in the sort of competitive, in the competitive market of religion or whatever, that Catholics, that the Catholic hierarchy has begun to lean more towards that kind of stuff and away from some of the social um, if you look issues. at like the bedrock of the um, of the union movement in this country, it's the Catholic worker. Oh, uh, that's like so, a- I mean, absolutely. Well, this. let's not let's not short the Jews in that no, respect the Jew, either. No, the but, Jews were. It's but yeah, I mean, look at look at, right. look at look at Pittsburgh's history. You know, there's a Catholic church in Braddock that housed workers during during the late 19th century during the work you know during the work strife there. So, if you want to know which direction the church is going, you want to have a progressive sounding pope. Let's go back to 8. 18- 1991, Pope Leo the Eighth, Thirteenth, Thirteenth. May Eighth, I meant Thirteenth. Okay, Thirteenth. He said that the proliferation of unions was is greatly to be desired. Yeah. Okay. And in regard to this, here's our current yeah. Pope, who no, would no way be mistaken for a progressive. Benedict has written that the unions have always been encouraged and supported by the church and the also conservative U.S. Congress, a conference of Catholic bishops, yes. uh, in 1986 in a pastoral letter said, yes. no one may deny the right to organize without attacking human dignity itself. And well, maybe they should start teaching Catholicism at Duquesne and start, the administrators, yeah, yeah. and start with the administration. Yeah. I mean, I think it's very, and it's very important that we say this, that what Duquesne has done is foreclose the possibility of, of these adjuncts being able to organize at all. They did not let them organize on their own. They are trying to fight their ability to organize through an LRB election. They have deliberately put these guys into a catch-22. They simply have no options. They have absolutely done exactly what the church says no it's one should mor- ever do. No, and is morally indefensible. Way to go, Duquesne! Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, pleasure as always. City paper. Is that is that is that the thing that you wrote about this in, in this It is issue? in this week's... Okay, so gosh, you got Jag off, you got uh, Potter's uh, Duquesne University screed, you got all that good stuff uh, to read. So uh, do it, okay? And Tom Sokolowski tomorrow. Lynn Coven Live, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Coven Live are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper, Steel City Media, and its advertisers.